Okay, I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me. Uh, we don't. Most of what you heard this morning was in uh, microbes or prokaryotic cells, and we work in insects, which, as a choice of chassis, is a little more complicated uh, than a prokaryotic cell. And correspondingly, what we are able to do is much more simple, much more basic than you can see in prokaryotes. So, so I hope you will see some some hint of the sort of engineering principles and sophistication, systematization of some of the speakers this morning, but I'm afraid in detail we are a long way behind in that respect. But nonetheless, there are, there are good reasons to work in insects, and a key driver is that they do an awful lot of harm. Agricultural pests do billions of dollars, dollars of damage of harm. Mosquitoes transmit diseases like malaria, which was mentioned this morning because of artemisinin, and also dengue, which I, which I will talk about. And there are uh, many, many millions of cases of uh, human disease from these, also livestock and crop diseases. So, so what is our objective in, in, in terms of uh, product? We aim to produce engineered sterile male insects. They will go out and look for female pest insects to mate with. And if they are sterile, then the, those females who make one of these sterile will have no or fewer progeny. And so the population in the next generation will be smaller than it would otherwise have been. And that is the concept. We call it release of insects carrying a dominant lethal genetic system, which pretty much says what it is. And uh, in terms of when, there are a number of comments about uh, products and phenotypes. I'll show you towards the end that we have actually gone out to the field with some of these strains. And we had uh, releases of a genetically engineered moth from 2006 in the United States and of this f uh, uh, full-blown genetic system in mosquitoes in the Cayman Islands in t from 2009 and other countries. Dengue, probably not as well known as malaria. It's a viral disease transmitted by mosquitoes. Uh, 50 to 100 million cases a year around the world in this broad tropical and subtropical area all through the Americas from about the US-Mexico border south and very southern tip of uh, China but all through Southeast uh, Asia. Uh, it's actually reappeared in, uh, in Florida and you may know there's been ongoing transmission in Key West in the Florida Keys uh, uh, 2009 and 2010. They would very, the Florida Keys Mosquito Control uh, District and the Florida State people would very, very much like to try our, uh, to use our technology against that. And the limiting factor is regulation, of which perhaps a few words later. Uh, dengue, I should say, unlike many other diseases, is, is very much on the rise around the world. The number of cases has approximately doubled every decade for the last four or five decades. This is the reality of dengue control. There is no vaccine, there are no therapeutic drugs, there are no prophylactic drugs. And so the weak point is the mosquito, so controlling the mosquito is the only way to control dengue. Unfortunately, the methods for doing it are very basic. It breeds in small pools of clean water, and so you can go around and look for those and try to tip them out or poison them, or you can indulge in uh, space spraying, which is your government doing something and very visible, but also not very environmentally friendly and actually rather ineffective at killing the mosquito. They hide, as you may. So this is our, this is our method. This is mosquito reproductive biology. Boy meets girl, sing songs to each other, which they really do. I'm not making it up. And in the normal way of things, lots of little baby mosquitoes, and so the population continues. So if we could produce sterile male mosquitoes, same thing, boy meets girl, sing little songs. Uh, these, these males would produce sperm. They would fertilize the egg. But because of something we've done to the genetics of the male, which would be carried by the sperm, the, pro the offspring would not survive to adulthood. This has a number of advantages. One of them is that the males would go out and look actively for the females for you, more, more enthusiastically perhaps than uh, human inspectors, and certainly more cheaply. And also, the males are very selective. They will mate, seek out and mate females of the same species only, and not all the other things, uh, insects that might be in the environment, so the, bird, the bees and the butterflies and so on, would be completely unaffected. So that's what we're trying to do. In slightly more formal genetic terms, we're trying to make something that uh, that is homozygous for a dominant lethal gene. So the, those are the males, mate with the female, all the progeny inherit one copy of the lethal gene, it's dominant, and so they die. One aspect of that that will probably jump out at you is that these have two copies of a lethal gene, so why aren't they dead? So clearly we have to have this conditional and repressible in some way so that we can rear these in the laboratory but then release them into the field. Furthermore, that has to be stage-specific so that after release, they, they live even though they carry two copies of the gene. So this starts to define some of the parameters for the genetic engineering. Another aspect, I don't really have time to go into the reasons for this, but there's significant advantages to making the, the gene female-specific. So although this is homozygous for a, 
uh, a dominant lethal and all the progeny inherit, only the females die, the males carry one copy, and so half of their daughters will also die. There are a number of technical issues about trying to do this, uh, many of which have been described in a prokaryotic context, and the problems are at least as severe, and the tools rather more restricted in a, in a eukaryotic or, or um, metazoan context. Precise control of expression. So I could define for you in a sort of Boolean, truth logic, truth table kind of way who we want to live and who we want to die, but that sort of digital on and off expression is not available to us with the kinds of promoters we want. We want when we switch on a lethal effector, we want the insects to die. When it's off, we don't just want them to not die, we want them to be happy, fertile, sexy males. And if they're a bit sick, they're probably not going to be as attractive to the females as they would otherwise be. So, so this precise control of expression is a major, major problem. There are a few, there are a few promoters. One day in the future, we will be able to build up synthetic promoters from, de from defined enhancer and silencer and so on regulatory elements. That is a long way off yet for, uh, for insects. We, we're using a lot of combinatorial control to try and get the specificities we want because we often can't find natural promoters that, that will do that. Um, we have rather limited options for conditionality. The Tethoff system has been excellent for us. There are not too many alternatives, particularly orthogonal alternatives to that. There's a number of issues about insertion sites. Crosstalk between functional modules is a big deal. I think one of the different... For me, some of the big differences of going from a, a sort of bespoke engineering perspective, which I don't think is like throwing a pile of concrete and steel into a river and calling it a bridge. It is more like a medieval craftsman making a one-off uh, item and then making another item independently the second time. A big difference is the, uh, is the standardised parts and also standardised knowledge and not reinventing the wheel. So we need some of these components in a standardised form. But in terms of not reinventing the wheel, I heard Drew talk about uh, using a, a throwaway leader sequence to try to sort out uh, to, and standardise ribosomal uh, control. We did that uh, quite independently, which basically highlights my lack of knowledge of the prokaryotic uh, literature, and we were exactly reinventing the wheel, which is exactly what we should not have been doing. And a, a further problem that we have is that we don't just want it to work in different strains of bacteria, we want it to work, it to work in different species of insects, and we want the same components, or at least the same design principles, to work in different species of insects. Insects are very ancient order. When we go from uh, fruit flies to moths, you're talking about a last common ancestor 300 million years ago. So what do we use? We use a tetracycline regulated expression system. Many of you will know this. Essentially, if you imagine a promoter driving an effector, we can, we can introduce a module that imparts conditionality, in fact, responsiveness to tetracycline, by inserting this module in between the promoter and the effector. So now the promoter doesn't drive the expression of the effector molecule directly. It drives expression of this synthetic transcription factor uh, from uh, Herman Bujard, published in the early 90s which then binds a specific sequence and then drives the, the expression of this effector. And the magic of this, of this molecule, of this protein, is it has a very high affinity for tetracycline. In the presence of tetracycline, it doesn't bind DNA and therefore doesn't drive the expression of this promoter. And that gives us a conditional module that we can combine with a promoter module in a, in a combinatorial way. We also want to add female specificity to this. In some instances, we can find a female-specific promoter. In others, we can't. And where we can't, we have tended to use a... Uh, an alternative splicing module, which is, again, is something we can add to uh, an open reading frame to give, uh, in this case, sex-specific expression. So we want to be here with the expression in a defined time and tissue, conditional and, and sex-specific, and we can combine these different independent modules to give us this effect that we want, and that is what we have done. So to give you an example of that... We want, to, we want late acting female specific uh, expression in a mosquito. These are, the, these are the mosquitoes. This is expression in this case. This is using an, a specific promoter and driving a, a reporter molecule. And you can see expression in the females in the absence of tetracycline, but not in the presence of tetracycline, and not in males, whether on or off tetracycline. So that's giving us very tight control. This is actually expressed in the indirect flight muscles. And if we express something that has an effect other than just fluorescence. We get males that look like this, which is perfectly normal mosquito males that buzz around quite normally. But this, this gene is expressed in the indirect flight muscles. They're not essential for life, but they are, they are essential for flight. 
So whereas the males raised in the absence of the repressor uh, fly around perfectly happily, the females can't fly because we have this conditional precise expression of a molecule in their indirect fly muscles that affect the indirect fly muscles, which means they can't fly. They can jump a little bit. That's different sets of muscles in the legs. Flightless mosquitoes can't, obviously can't survive in the wild. They can't avoid predators. They can't find hosts. They can't go and bite people. Actually, they can't mate even in the lab because they can't sing songs to each other, which is about wing beat frequency. So we then, we've tested these out. We've put them into large field cages. And large, this is actually large indoor laboratory cages and shown that you can suppress target populations of mosquitoes. So there are three cages, six cages set up. Three of them we did not add these uh, sterile males. Three of them we did. The three cage populations to which we added the sterile males went extinct in 10 to 20 weeks after we started adding them. We simplified, I'll skip over this, we simplified the molecular biology a little bit to get around the issue of needing specific uh, promoters that will work in different species. That, that architecture now works across uh, uh, different orders of insects, so hundreds of million years of evolutionary time, which gets around, helps us get around this problem. Those insects we've gone out into the field with, this is the first one we did in the Cayman Islands in collaboration with the Cayman Islands Mosquito Research and Control Unit. We released them into this 16 he hectare area uh, uh, here, and this is, the, this is a, one of our control sites, not released, about six and a half, about five and a half months of releases, about 3.3 million engineered males released during that period into this area. And the consequence, this is the control site, which is, it, the population is driven by rainfall seasonality, and so it expands and then goes up to this sort of level. This is the, uh, this is the population in the area only about 500 metres away where we were releasing the engineered sterile males. And you can see we see strong suppression of the target male population. So in short, this, uh, this medium-scale field trial was a complete success. All the endpoints were met. We showed clear suppression of the target population from about the beginning of uh, August. And so, in short, sustained release of these engineered males can suppress a field population of Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. That's the dengue uh, vector. The degree of suppression you get is, Im is limited by immigration because it's adjacent to areas that we're not treating and some mosquitoes fly in. And more generally, genetically modified mosquitoes can perform successfully uh, in the field. I could spend more than my entire lot of time talking about regulation and... Uh, political and uh, public engagement activities, just to say there is a lot of regulatory activity. We would like rational, science-based, uh, harmonized, timely and predictable regulation, and we don't have it. One could debate whether we have any one of those things, but we certainly don't have all of them. Nonetheless, we have gone out into the field with 15 million engineered uh, agricultural pests in the US from 2006, that's actually a 2008 experiment, and also those mosquitoes that I told you about, that was the Cayman Islands. We've also uh, act, have actual release experiments in Malaysia and Brazil and a, a number of other countries interested. The public in general has been pretty uh, supportive of this kind of technology. This is some focus group reactions in Malaysia. Uh, some anti-GM NGO groups have opposed, but most of them see that the health benefits and the use and the, and the uh, structure is very different from genetically modified crops, for example, which they generally, uh, th which these groups have historically opposed. So just to wrap up, I'd like to th thank the various people who have uh, helped with this, the, our collaborators in many, in many countries. Uh, this is to point out some of our collaborators, but also the sort of worldwide press that this, is, that this has got, this sort of technology has got, but really extremely favorable. And that's changed a little bit. A few years ago, when there was press stories about uh, our and other people's modified mosquito work around the world, it was, you know, hopes and fears in respect of genetically modified mosquitoes. So, you know, the potential, but also some sort of uh, uh, environmental and, and other concerns. This, this, which is actually about the flightless technology that I showed in the video, very much more uh, uniformly positive. This is, uh, this is the Times of India, but that you can see in uh, a Brazilian and a Chinese and so on uh, newspaper around the world, really very positive uh, reporting. So I think... The public in general sees uh, you know, dengue and mosquito-borne diseases as a, as a very bad thing and uh, doing something about them as a very good thing. And we have that huge shared ground and then we're just debating the method. Whereas perhaps for GM crops, at least in Western countries, it's, it's, it's harder for people to see a specific benefit associated with the technology to the individual uh, citizen and consumer. And I think that greatly <laughs> differentiates this kind of technology and may 
although early days yet, may uh, differentiate the public and NGO community response to this sort of field use of uh, engineered and synthetic biology approaches, in this case in insects. Thank you. First, again, I should thank the organizers to invite me to this uh, wonderful meeting. And also, I should appreciate Professor Yang to give me this chance to give such a, a talk on the genomics and its relevance to the synthetic biology. <clears throat> so I will count from one to five to things related to genomics and also the synthetic biology. First, perhaps I will start with the uh, genomics and uh, its history. Uh, the Human Genome Project draft sequence was announced at 2000, and uh, last year was its 10th anniversary. Most of the, the uh, members of the project has been uh, celebrated this wonderful achievements and also is a milestone for the further genomics and also the whole biology study. And uh, several years, years ago, it was doubted whether uh, we could complete the genome of our cells. And uh, some of the, the researchers has published this, this doubt on, on the uh, journals, but science makes things possible. <clears throat> On the year 2001, uh, Professor Yang joined the, the group meeting of the Human Genome Project, and China has become the latest contributor to this worldwide sequencing efforts. And uh, together with the France, Germany, Japan, UK, and USA, and less our 1% project. The Human Genome Project not, not only provides a map of sequence, the tool of sequencing, but also uh, brought a science of genomics and also showed this century will be a century of biology. And the last but the most important thing is also a basis for the synthetic biology. So for the life science, there's two languages. Interest. Most of the, the uh, researchers agree with Craig and uh, Watson that life is of sequence. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, recently, we have more and more reached this uh, speech, life is digital, not, uh, not an act note. And uh, that, that is the, the John Sutton says, the, instructions of making a life from one generation to next is digital. So if we build this strong belief, can we just uh, lead to the determination to build powerful sequencing and computing platforms? Uh, we have just started our uh, works on genomics, first using the, the Sanker sequencers and also have some uh, primary the, the computing platforms, which is only 50 megabytes per day the, the, is the, the data generating amounts. So today we, we have grown up and uh, all the, the sequencing technologies has been uh, in incredibly improved. So today BGI can generate more than uh, one terabyte data. And uh, also we have other comparative uh, computing platforms. So the storage and the memory was shared above. Also, as uh, Professor Yang has mentioned, we have more than 800 bioinformaticians plus the, the colleagues at the research and development colleagues, that, that is uh, more than 1,000. So employ one, more than 1,000 uh, researchers at our team is really a place to sing. BGI not only be uh, interested in the, the uh, cutting edge projects, but also be willing to develop softwares and databases we have some uh, 
tools being widely used both on uh, genome assembly and uh, alignments and annotation. And also we have done some, some uh, studies on the population genomics and uh, has developed some comparative genomics tools for researchers. So I should give some uh, quick introduction to our five projects on the human genomics. First is from 1% to 100%. As I has just mentioned, we have uh, joined the human genome projects, but on 2007, we have finished our uh, first Asian genome that is independently uh, finished by BGI staff. So that is from uh, 1% to 100%, and uh, we will go further by joining some international collaborations, that is the 1,000 genome projects, together with the, the UK and US institutes. And uh, these projects will extend it to 2,500 in the phase two. And the phase one uh, publications has been uh, showed last year on nature genetics. The second thing is the building human pan genome. We, with our uh, excellent uh, genome assembly tools, we have uh, tried to build the sequence map of human pan genome. And we not only shows that every person's genome is different, but also the sequence with population specificity has the, the uh, specific uh, functions in each different populations. So that, that would be an exciting uh, science uh, discovery, I should say. And the, the third thing is the environmental adaption. We has uh, sequenced the human exomes from the, the residents of Tibetan. They are. Uh, they showed very strong high uh, attitude adaptions. So we compared them to to some people in live in the normal attitudes and has identified that certain genes has the uh, roles in the this high attitude adaptation. And uh, this study has revealed a functional important locus in the genetic adaption to, to high attitude. And the fourth thing is the human metagenomes. The, as other speakers have mentioned, the other, our other genome, the, the human gaunt microbial gene, has been uh, sequenced by, by our correlation projects. And, uh, uh, was published last year, and we have initiated one uh, ten thousand microbial genome projects to to sequence more uh, microbials related to the energy industry, uh, <coughs> disease, and also the uh, environmental. The fifth thing is the the Asian genome. We has. Uh, also generated uh, a sequence map of some Asian genome from 4,000 years ago and uh, has some interesting findings to, to relate to his health, as show, showed on the picture. Also, we will use this sequencing technology to di discover the population study by comparing different genomes both in human and also in other species on the life tree. That, that would be the, the uh, let me see, the ants and uh, rice, also the uh, sick one to, to study their, their population differences. Also, uh, we also uh, by, by generating their uh, sequence data, we can try to identify the modification on our genome, that it would be the epigenome. So on the sick worm, we have to do some further study on the epigenomic map, and uh, that shows some uh, interesting findings published on Nature Biotechnology.
with the the the, the genome data we have just generated is only a, a small number of all these species. So if we want to uh, construct the, the complete tree of life, we should uh, get more and more information about these species, not only their, their genome sequence, but also to uh, some gene of function or their uh, specificity in each different species. And we has initiated more and more international projects to sequence all these species. And uh, the third thing is the three breakthroughs in the first decade of uh, of the twenty first century. As just mentioned, the sequencing technologies has been uh, undoubtedly one of the, the breakthroughs, and uh, the sequencing has been faster and more, much more cheaper. Also, the third generation will in, enable us to look into the, the biology in different point of view. Also, the GWAS study has uh, brought us the, the uh, understanding to build more and more large bio bank and uh, to have some uh, comprehensive records of the, all the samples to enable us to finally draw the conclusion on the disease or other things related to health. And the first thing is some uh, techniques change the world. I think this will uh, go very quickly. First is the gene manipulations and uh, it has been used not only on microbes but also cell culture plants and animals. And uh, like some uh, usually used uh, methods, gene knockout locking and other uh, side directed mutation genesis, the application to, to gene tests, gene drugs, and uh, other gene therapies has been uh, more and more used. Also, the clone is another uh, technology inside of us. The, the famous ship has been. Uh, well known and uh, what BGI has done is to clone some pigs by hand. It will enable these technologies to uh, be more widely used. And uh, the other hotspot would be the stem cell and IPS. There's uh, numerous publications on these fields and uh, the stem cells not only can, can uh, differentiate into various cell types to benefit in the, the treatments of many diseases. I should say that the stem cell, understanding the stem cell would bring us a, a new view into the mystery of biology. And the, the, I should come to the point is the synthetic biology. The, uh, after we generated all this data, we have got a, a more breaks a more seriously uh, understanding for the life and uh, if you want to get more uh, information about the metabolic signaling pathways and gene regulation networks, maybe we should uh, reconstruct them and uh, redesign them. And that will be a process from read to write. Uh, I should thank this uh, slide from Dr. Joandi. And uh, we say that the human genome project will be a basis of the synthetic biology. Then we, we should have some more things to go on with it. So, doing the synthetic biology will answer the question perhaps life is what we made it. And, uh, If we can make a life with sequence and computers, this will perhaps be a different whole world. And uh, the first, luckily, the first step has been done by, by Craig Venter and is mentioned by many speakers. So I, I don't want to get, get in through with it. And combine all these uh, breakthrough technologies will brought us 
the the century of biology to come to. So many of the, the public uh, journals and uh, mediums has been uh, take, taking this into consideration and uh, says that the life science will shake up the, the world in the 21st century. So what our, our team or, or our collaborators are uh, mainly focused on, on synthetic biology, maybe first one is the uh, synthesis technology. I, I should say this is more uh, focused on the DNA synthesis. So the, the maximum length of the DNA synthesis is also the occurrence. This goes in hand in hand. And the, the time efficiency and the, the cost is also taken in consideration. So developing the high throughput synthesis is uh, uh, more and more labs are uh, taking their efforts into and uh, we are also kind of interested in this array-based uh, DNA synthesis. Also, to have some, uh, we should say, database or more widely, the, the registry of parts is not only contained the, the information, but also should have some bank to uh, get all these physical materials get uh, well set and easy to be available to the public. And uh, the third thing is the engineerable life. As uh, Andy has showed, the, the primary uh, uh, primary results of it, we, we are aiming to uh, design and build to carry guys a uh, kind of thousand standard biology parts. And uh, we just joined this set of projects uh, initiated by BioFab and to test different uh, parts of the expression operating units, that is the, the ideal model of the, the genes. And by understanding promoter and terminators, we will perhaps do further works on the uh, other UTRs or regions to, to get more information about other things, such as the structure or, or things made effect of the, the uh the usage or the efficiency of the this EOU. So the the steps would be standardized and uh, test the modeling and finally construct a uh, registry and this is our uh, photos taken by the correlation studies. Also when uh the trying to start another project to construct the first fully en en uh, engineerable E. coli cells that have been called the LIFE 2.0. But this project is uh, still under plans and we are trying to get more and more uh, advices and collaborators. Also, this has also been mentioned by many uh, speakers. The, the standard language for, for sorry, just, just uh, come to the end. The standard language of synthetic biology is also very important parts. And uh, if we, all the researchers are doing synthetic biology can uh, communicate and design all the parts and device systems in, in, a, in the same language, that would be uh, very wonderful and uh, uh, very effective. And the, the last thing, maybe the most important thing is the, the phenotype correlation and the other applications. So we have some, uh, I should say, crazy ideas about the, the uh, metagenome. We perhaps will ta uh, test all the uh, metagenome on a very large scale to reconstruct the, the uh, human gun genome, metagenome. That will be the, the meta square projects and uh, the platform and techniques to carry out these projects is uh, still under evaluating. And as Professor Yang says, it is science uh, to change the world and the future of man. So BGI is uh, willing to, to collaborate with all the teachers and uh, uh, researchers from all over the world and uh, 
been rooted in the Chinese culture and has some some uh, basic assets from the Chinese culture. So genomics cannot be done alone. So it's synthetic biology, and. Uh, we will show our operations on our teachers and the collaborators. There are so many uh, friends and teachers uh, help us in our projects, so it cannot be listed on one slide. And uh, I just use some uh, old Chinese sayings: "When you drink from the well, don't forget who helped dig it." So the BGI is aiming to use all the the. Uh, Genom genomic techniques to be served as a, a bar. Any of our friends or teachers can choose the, the genomics uh, sequencing they want. But also, all the uh, BGI staff, especially our young generations, are curious to explore the, the uh, mystery of uh, biology under our uh, collaborators' guidance and help. And uh, also, we are willing to apply all these technologies to the, the uh, life in the future. So I should say thanks for your attention. OK, so we now have a routine for questions, which is um, uh, that we would like you to uh, give us your name, even if you've given it before, and your affiliation. Um, so let's take some questions in the next 10 minutes in relation to these two papers. Oh, and wait for the microphone, which you are doing. <laughs> um, hi, it's uh, Kirsten Neely from uh, TMO Renewables. I'm afraid this is probably not a very um, synthetic biology question, but um, I was very interested in um, Luke's uh, talk, and I just wanted to uh, know with the um, uh, mosquitoes that you've uh, developed, is the, the plan to completely eradicate permanently um, the mosquitoes or just control the population? And if the plan is to completely eradicate, what, what's the sort of um, take on the role that they play in um, the food chain, et cetera, et cetera? Okay, to, to explore that re briefly, obviously environmental issues are a major concern with all, with all environmental use of technologies, I mean chemical technologies as well as GM technologies. The short answer is no, we do not intend to eradicate the, 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 the species. We would like to suppress and may be able to locally eliminate uh, specific target populations. I should point out that Aedes aegypti is native to a part of East Africa in the places, that, none of the places that, that we're working is it in fact a native species. Uh, and it is one of thousands of species of mosquito. One of the advantages of our technology is it's exquisitely species specific. Those males were not mate even with other related species of mosquito. You may know, you may have seen a paper in uh, a commentary and some follow up in Nature not that long ago about the question whether, about whether any mosquitoes are any use for anything and whether you could eradicate the whole lot from the planet. That is way, way beyond uh, anything that we would well, advocate, let alone attempt. Uh, the, the, the only mosquitoes that we really care about in terms of human disease transmission are the ones that have a very high propensity for biting humans. You probably know there are very many other mosquitoes uh, happily and harmlessly to humans biting birds and other animals and, and so on. So the disease transmitting ones are, are a small minority and uh, no, we're only aiming to control them in specific locations. May I ask you a question because we are sitting so close to each other. Now what about the safety? How to say? I mean, the, the, the safety issue by the public, and to our, uh, how to say, in our eyes, that the GM is not so popular in Europe. And then now you told us, of course, sure, that's true. You can do it in China, it will be most welcome. It could be accepted by the people in other regions. Then, could they ask the question, why don't you take this strategy in your own region? Why don't we do it in Oxford first? Yes, that question has been asked on occasion, uh, and it is a good question. Uh, obviously, the, the sort of trivial answer for Aedes aegypti and dengue is that we don't have Aedes aegypti or dengue in Britain, and so the prospects for 
using those particular ones in Britain would be limited. We could release the mosquito in Oxford and it would die pretty quickly because Oxford is a pretty cold place. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that, 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 that's, that's sort of, that's sort of trivialising. We do get that, you know, what about your own backyard sort of, sort of question. But actually, uh, the, you know, the safety and regulatory aspects are really important. And uh, I guess the largest single regulatory analysis was with the US Department of Agriculture for this technology in respect of agricultural pest insects, which is an environmental impact statement, which is the sort of gold standard in the US uh, system, and this was at a time when no, only, only two three years ago, when no environmental impact statement had been mm. completed for any GM crop, for example, which had all gone through on the lesser environmental uh, assessments. So we do take the that that question very uh, very seriously. Now, you could argue after the fact that actually we did do it in as close to our own country as we could get, because the Cayman Islands is a British overseas territory. But that would be actually, they're a very independent, uh, not quite sovereign nation still connected to Britain, and they chose to go first. And the fact that they happened to be a British overseas territory was quite irrelevant to the, uh, to, to the discussion. At the moment, the final decision on whether to deploy these kinds of technologies would be a sovereign question. And so essentially, each com at the moment, each country will make up its own mind what it wants to do, whether it wants to use it or not, and at what speed and with what provisos. Now for me, of course, I'm all for that. If you can just eradicate many, uh, how to say, insects in this way, we might not need the GM crops. That's another way. It's really excellent. Okay, more questions. Um, maybe, I, maybe while people are thinking, I, I was uh, fascinated, uh, Professor Yang, that um, I mean the numbers of people you seem to be quoting, or at least your colleague was quoting on the slides, that seem to be by UK standards to be enormous. Um, can you say a little bit about the funding mechanism for your <laughs> institute? I mean, how does that work? You know, I have just uh, have had a look at the, the book by the Royal Society that it is true China is enhancing its research by spending much more money than ever before. But as a small area of genomics, the funding is not enough, especially not enough for our ambitions. Mm -hmm. So now we, on one side, uh, do have got the funding from the central and the local governments. And then on the other side, you have seen we have done so many projects. Actually, nothing can be done without our collaborators. We share our sequencing capacity with all the collaborators. And then we also uh, do a little service in order to support so many projects as well as to feed our young people. Okay. I think that's the same, but especially for BJ, such a big institute, we are exploring the way in a developing country. Okay, we, we've got time for two questions. There's one over here first. Hmm? Yeah, uh, Rul Bovenberg, uh, DSM. I have a question about the E. coli uh, 2.0 projects. Uh, I wonder, could you explain a little bit more what you uh, have in mind, what, what to do? And the second question is, did it raise a lot of questions when you proposed this to start working on an, a novel version of E. coli? Yeah, I mean, perhaps, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, maybe the Dr. Joanne, you will be better to answer these questions, but as I discussed with him, I, may, I maybe say some understandings from my point of view. So first thing, we, we are, uh, the idea, idea is to make a fully in inexorable, inexorable uh, E. coli cells. So the first step would be uh, fully understand the whole genome of the E. coli. So perhaps the, the efficient way to carry things out is to separate the, all the uh, different regions of the genome into, we should say, the operators or other, other uh, small units and uh, synthesize them uh, one by one. And uh, if we can test all the performance and the, the sequencing, how to say, the uh, stability, of, of each part, maybe some of the, the parts will be dark region or, or cannot be synthesized by now, but we can generate it to, 
basic information one by one, and then we will combine all these uh, small units into a whole system and uh, test all the, the uh, genome performance, and uh, then perhaps on the, the system scales, we will test all whether they have some uh, specific functions or uh, specific roles in, in the whole systems. Okay, and there's one more question, then we'll finish. Uh, question, uh, Rick Johnson from Washington, D.C. Uh, question for Dr. Young. Uh, interested in the new uh, five, 12th five-year plan that the National Congress approved in, in March for China. Uh, what are your thoughts about what role synthetic biology will play in the broader uh, new five-year plan for science and technology? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very, I would say, nice question. Then you all have paid attention to the ambitious and the costly five-year plan. This is a 12th five-year plan by China. Through the effort of our, how do we call the respected older generation scientists like Professor Guo Pinzhou, now the government uh, has its emphasis on synthetic biology as one of the most important branches of life sciences. And then last year, I mean the year of 2000, uh, uh, 2010, and then that uh, basic research program, Professor Zhao, is it right, Jiu Qishan? That's a national program for basic research. We call the 973, it does not mean anything else, just, just because it was initiated in March of 1997. Set up a project with the budget of 130 uh, million yuan. Yes, 130 yes. Actually, how, no, that's not a secret. It's announced, definitely. Seventy to eighty million yuan. It's about seven hundred to eight hundred uh, British pounds. And then this year there will be another uh, program given by uh, the National Program of Basic Research on Synthetic Biology. And then as another one, it's called how to say, high tech program with the name of 863, also means the March of 1986. And then they will have a project now which is asking or calling for a proposal. Then uh, sponsored by Ministry of Finance, CAS, Chinese Academy of Science, is also initiating a project on synthetic biology. In addition to these three major funding agencies or programs, a National Natural Science Foundation of China is also planning to uh, set up several programs directly related or generally related <laughs> to synthetic biology. Okay. But I would always say that the science in China is still at its very beginning. I'm very, very pleased to see that now on this project, we collaborate at the very beginning. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm sure these topics will be coming up again during the two days, but I'd like to take the opportunity for us to once again thank the two speakers in this session, or actually three. <laughs> yeah.